All right, hello everybody and welcome to Radiant Pursuit. Thank you so much for joining me in today's video. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna look at five verses in the Bible, of course, in the New Testament. Sometimes we look at verses in the Old Testament, but that'll be for a future video. But in today's video, we're gonna look at five verses that very clearly debunk the idea or this doctrine theology of once saved, always saved, or in other words, unconditional eternal security. Now, the way that we're gonna do this today, what we're gonna look at specifically the the why these verses refute this idea is not so much always about the idea of salvation itself and whether you're going to heaven or hell, but there are tenets of that theology that say something very much like this. For example, once we're saved, God will never let us go and we can never leave. So in other words, it's not on us to hold on to it, hold on to our salvation, hold on to the grace of God, hold on to whatever way you want to put it, whatever way you want to say it, it's not really what important. What I'm going to try and prove to you guys today is that scripture does teach that we do play a role. We do play a part in being saved and it's not us initiating salvation. I will never say that. That is absolutely heretical to say that we are saving ourselves. I do not believe that. And I think that is blatantly unbiblical. What I do believe, however, is that we have to accept the free gift of eternal life that is from Christ. It is entirely from him and from his grace and mercy that we even have the opportunity to be saved. So once we accept it, I believe, unlike the one saved, always saved proponents, I believe that we have to hold on to that now. We cannot let it slip out of our fingers. We cannot let Satan come and snatch that away from us. We cannot let temptation and sin come into our life and overcome us and, I mean, and make us overcome and entangled by this sin. So essentially, I believe that we need to hold on to that salvation, hold on to that grace, that true gospel. We need to hold on to the hope in which we were saved. And we're going to look at the verses that very clearly demonstrate this fact. So stay tuned, guys. Thank you for watching, and let's go ahead and dive right into God's Word. If you guys have any disagreements, any comments, concerns, questions, whatever it may be, drop down comments down below in this video so we can spark some conversation and sharpen each other with the Word of God. All right, so let's go ahead and look at our first verse. And we're going to look at, again, we're going to look at five different verses right now. Some of them are a little bit more blatant than the others, and others are a little bit more implicit, while others are a little bit more explicit. But nonetheless, they all point to the same idea, and I'll do my best to explain it. And hopefully you guys can learn a thing or two. Like I've been learning so much from these passages and just reading the Bible uh, on my own. It's been phenomenal. All right. So the first passage we're going to look at is 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, sorry, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 and 2. So we're going to read along with me, my friends. So the word says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So, my friends, there's a few points here in this verse that is just needs to be addressed. The first one is that this is addressed to believers, born again Christians. Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you. So, they have already heard the gospel. That's one. Secondly, which you also received. So they received this. And we know this if we just take the fact that he says brethren. That alone should be enough for us to know that these are actual genuine Christians. But he makes it very clear. The gospel was preached to you by him and they received it. They received this gospel. And he says, and in which you stand. All right. So this is very important because a lot of proponents of one saved, always saved, like to say that once you receive the gospel, once you are born again, you're going to remain saved perpetually. And this is basically the focus of this video, obviously, the verses that I'm presenting to you guys. I believe that just because you've accepted the gospel does not automatically mean that you will perpetually for the rest of your life stand firm on that truth. I think that we can deviate from it, abandon it altogether, or be entangled and overcome by sin once again. And we can be distracted. There's many things that we can do, but this is making it very clear that we need to stand in the gospel. He said that you stand, okay? And if we keep reading, this is even more important. He says, by which also you are saved. All right, so this gospel is what saves them. It's what has saved them, okay? And that's, you know, Bible 101. We are saved by the gospel, by, by what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Of course, the gospel message itself isn't saving us. It's what Christ did. The gospel message reflects what Christ did. It's the message of Christ. So we are saved by the gospel. And he says, you are saved by the gospel if, okay? And this right there, my friends, this is, this destroys the argument entirely of wanting to always saved. Remember, he's talking to people who are already born again believers. He says, brethren, 
which already proves it. But if you don't think so, he says, I preach the gospel to you and you have received it and you stand in it. So these are people that have received and accepted and stand right now in the truth of the gospel. And they are saved. It says, by which you also are saved. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So there's two things we can take from that. The first one is uh, the first part, if you hold fast that word, which I preach to you. And this is the focus of this video, guys. We need to hold fast. We need to remain in Christ. We need to hold on to, keep a firm grasp of eternal life, of the truth of the gospel. God is not going to hold on to it for us on our behalf. No, my friends, we need to hold on to it. You need to hold on to it, and I need to hold on to it, lest it slips out of my fingers, out of our fingers. And the second part is, unless you believed in vain. Now this, proponents of ones that always say, like to say that, well, these people, these brethren, you know, there it says brethren, but they like to say that these people actually believed in vain. They didn't really believe it to begin with. That's, that's not what he's saying. I don't believe that's what he's saying. I think he's saying that this is something that we can do. You can believe in the beginning. We can start this race and yet not finish it. We can embark on this path and start running this race we call Christianity and yet, and at some point, stop. Deviate from the, from the race. Stop running altogether. Just become lukewarm and complacent. We can, we can, we can stop. And that's what this is talking about. Unless you believed in vain. You started believing. You believed, actually. You really did. But you didn't believe until the very end. So you believed in vain. It was, it was, a, it was of no um, fruit. There was no purpose in believing for just a time, but not believing for the rest of your life. Why start something you're not going to finish? That's what I believe Paul's talking about here. And I really, really believe that that's just the truth, overall truth about the Word of God. Okay, we can believe in vain. We can start believing, truly being born again and being on fire for God, being a true disciple of Christ, and then come sin or come temptation that we are not willing to, to, to put aside, this pet sin that we're unwilling to rebuke, or whatever it may be, temptations or you know confusion, doubt, whatever in the world it may be, there are very, very many things that are easily entangling us if we allow them to. And... That's what I believe he's talking about here in this passage. If we hold fast to that word which he preached, which Paul preached, the truth of the gospel, then we will be saved. But we need to hold fast, my friends. We need to stand in it and hold fast to it all throughout our lives until the very end. Like Jesus said all over the place, he who endures to the end will be saved. Amen. So that's the first passage. Second passage is found in Hebrews 10, 23. We're going to read several passages in the book of Hebrews because this, my friends, this book, this epistle is probably the best book to refute once it's always saved. And it's also, not surprisingly, the book that most proponents of once it's always saved, from my experience, dislike. They really don't like this book. They think it has a lot of issues. And it's, you know, it's clear that that would be the case because obviously it doesn't line up with a the doctrine they want to believe is the truth. So what does this passage say? Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Amen. So keep a few key points. Let's dissect this really quick. First and foremost, the purpose of this video, let us hold fast. Okay. So the author of the book of Hebrews is saying, we need to hold fast. We need to hold firmly, continuously keep a firm grasp of the confession of our hope, the gospel, what we believed in, what we set, what the, the faith that we accepted and we placed our faith in Christ. We need to keep a firm grasp on that. We need to hold it fast. And now the second point without wavering, this right here is the key point. Really? Excuse me. He makes it very clear. We can waver. If we, if once he's always saved was true, that means that we cannot waver from the, the truth. We cannot waver from the faith that we've come into agreement with. We cannot waver from the path that we have set on. But guys, if that was the case, why in the world do, do we read this? Why do you say without wavering? Let us not only hold it, even though he's talking to people who are already born again believers, if you read the book of Hebrews, it becomes clear. But secondly, he says, now hold it without wavering. If one saved, always saved was true, we would not need to be preaching, holding on to anything because God's going to hold on to it for us. And we're going to hold on to it perpetually because we're already saved. And there's nothing we can do to stop holding on to it. And secondly, we can never waver from it because what I just said before, God is going to hold on to us God, and we are never going to let go of God because we're not going to want to, or we're simply unable to, whatever it is that they say, it doesn't make any sense. We need to hold on to it. After we are saved, we need to hold on to that. Hold on to that saving grace. Hold on to that truth. And do not let it go for anything. And do not waver. 
because God who promised is faithful. We don't have to worry about God's faithfulness. He is, <laughs> he is so faithful and we don't have to worry about that. But guys, we're pretty fickle and we need to hold on to it. We need to hold on to it and stay true to the course that we've set on. Keep running this race faithfully until the end. Amen. All right. Passage number three. And it's like, like I said, only going to look at five passages in today's video, guys. These are verses that you need to know. You need to be equipped to be able to defend the truth of conditional eternal security. Get equipped, saints. Let's get equipped. All right. Hebrews 10, 35 to 36. Now, Hebrews 10 is one of the best chapters in the entire Bible to refute once he's always saved as well. Hebrews 10, 26 is a phenomenal verse. Check it out. We're not going to look at it today because it doesn't line up with the specifics of holding on to the truth, which is what we're looking at today. So, he was 10, 35 to 36. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Firstly, do not cast away your confidence. If one thing always saved was true, we as born again believers are not capable of casting away our confidence. We cannot throw it away. We cannot abandon it because we simply won't. They'll argue that if someone did, that they claimed they were, they claimed to have been a born again believer, a true disciple of Christ, if they at some point abandoned the faith, then they would say, well, they, ne they were never really saved to begin with. My friends, that is a ridiculously unbiblical and illogical argument that has no grounds. And I say this because we as human beings do not have the authority nor the ability to judge the heart of man. We cannot tell and see if someone truly is or was saved. We simply can't. We judge by the fruits and that's it. It is an assumption. It is a judgment, but it is not the truth. It is not objective. It is subjective. So the argument, okay, well, they were never really saved to begin with because they abandoned the faith. It's just, it's an argument of straw. It doesn't really hold its own weight. It really doesn't. So taking that aside, do not cast away your confidence. And again, like I said earlier, the book of Hebrews, this is written to born again believers. And if you read it, you'll make it, you'll see it's very clear. Do not cast away your confidence. Once it always saved, says that you cannot abandon the faith. You cannot let go of the truth of God, his compassion. You cannot let go of his mercy. You would never want to even. And I believe that we wouldn't ever want to, but sin is very enticing. My friend, sin is very enticing and we can still choose sin over God. So that's the first thing. Do not cast away your confidence. Secondly, for you have need of endurance. My friends, this is so key. So key when understanding what true eternal security, which I believe is conditional eternal security, is. We need endurance. Jesus says, he who endures to the end shall be saved. He who endures to the end shall be saved. It doesn't get any clearer than that, my friends. If you want to twist that to saying, oh, well, it's not really talking about salvation as in getting to heaven, then, you know, oh, well, I can't. I can't convince you any further. Just, you know, may God help us all. So that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. You may receive the promise. Not that we will, but that we may. If we endure, if we do not cast away our confidence, then we may receive the promise. And there's another passage we're not going to look at today, but it says the righteous are scarcely saved. And that's a very scary, scary verse. But I think it kind of lines up with this. Um, I think it's in second Peter or something, but it's a very interesting verse that I haven't done a video on yet, but I will soon because it is powerful. It's just like, if even the righteous, the truly righteous are scarcely saved, barely saved, what does that have to say with complacent Christians, lukewarm Christians, gosh, unfearful Christians. It's, it's very scary stuff, but this is the third passage. Very, very powerful stuff. Passage number four, second to last passage, and the last verse we're going to look at in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 4, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Here it is again, the same thing like the verse before. Do not cast away your confidence. Oh no, it was something else. There we go. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Hebrews 10, 23. Hebrews 4.14, the verse we just read now, same thing. Let us hold fast our confession. Second time we read this in the same book. Let us hold fast our confession. If something is said once in the Bible, it's already important. But if it's said more than once, guys, we need to really take note of this. Hold fast our confession. And what is our confession? It is that God died and that he rose again. Jesus Christ died on Calvary for our sins and he, di he, he died rose again and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of the father. He is our high priest. I guess it's right here. He's a great high priest. 
He's our mediator between God the Father and us, God and man. He is our mediator. And we, no one else gets to the Father. No one else gets to heaven except through Him. So let us hold fast to that confession, that truth, our confession of repentance, of belief, of faith, of obedience in Christ. Let us hold on to that and continue in that for the rest of our lives. That is what he's talking about here, my friends. Once you always safe says that you will automatically do that once you enter into saving faith. My friends, that's not true. You're not going to automatically do anything. We can, we can truly become born again one day and the very next day become entangled in sin once again. There is no promise that you will endure. No, there weren't in the Bible does it say that you are guaranteed to endure. But on the other side, um, but rather we are commanded to endure over and over again, exhorted to, to endure, encouraged to endure, and to make sure that we keep our eyes set on the true prize, which is Christ, which is eternal life, and not be distracted by the fleeting pleasures of this world. Why would the Bible teach us these things if we simply could not even do that? If we could not choose and abandon what we already have and choose sin? If we couldn't do that, if we were simply incapable of abandoning the faith and letting go of the confession which we have placed our hope in at some point, why is that all over Scripture? Why are there so many warnings, guys? Take heed to these warnings, my friends. Take heed to these warnings. Once he's always saved is a bunch of baloney, man. All right, and the last verse we're going to look at in today's video, the fifth passage, is Colossians 1, 21 to 23. And I made a video on this recently, guys. I highly encourage you to check it out. I made a full study on this verse, and I went in-depth as to how this verse, this passage, completely destroys the idea of once you're always saved. So I'm going to touch on it a little bit today, with again, with the focus of holding on. So let's read it together, guys. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled you... He has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If, indeed, you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard. Guys, honestly, I read this several weeks ago and it was like, how, how, do, how does anybody read this and believe once they're always saved? The only way you can really do that is to completely twist this passage into saying something that it's not. Because if you guys are not aware, Colossians is, a, is an epistle written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Coloss. This is a, 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 a group of born-again believers. Call, Paul calls them saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's what he's writing to. And it's very clear. You were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. And now he, Jesus, has reconciled you in the body of his flesh through death. So these are born again believers. They, they, they are Christians. Okay. So they've already been wrecked. This is what he says. Yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. That is the purpose of reconciliation. That is what he's saying is, is going to happen. It might happen. This is, this is, this is our goal. It is to be reconciled with Christ, with the Lord God, our Father, through Jesus Christ. It is to be reconciled with him to, so that Jesus would present us holy and blameless and above reproach in the sight of God. Now, in order to do that, in order to get to that place, to be holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight, we need to what? Continue in faith, grounded, remain grounded and steadfast and not be moved away from the hope of the gospel which we've heard. My friends, this is the truth right here. It is very clear. It is so very clear, my friends. We need to continue in the faith. God is not going to continue in the faith for us. The same way that we entered into saving faith by placing our faith in Jesus Christ, we need to remain in that faith. He's not going to keep us in that faith. Like, He is going to simply just grab us and never let us go. Like, even if we choose to walk away, like if we say, Lord, I, re I rebuke you and I, and I abandon you. I want nothing to do with you. And I, 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 I don't love you anymore. God, I actually, I, I don't love you at all. And I want to, you know, I like sin more than I love you. So I'm going to go and I'm going to go sin now. And I'm going to choose sin over you. Do you really believe that God is going to say, no, you chose me five years ago. So you're going to stay here. Even if you don't like it, like, I just don't understand where people get that idea. Like, I don't get it. God is not going to force his, his grace and his, 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 his completely undeserved kindness on anyone. He's not going to force that on anyone, my friends. If we don't want it, God's like, all right, you know, 
It, it pains me. The Lord said that he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He takes no pleasure. He does not delight in that at all, but he desires for all to come to repentance, even those who were once saved. Come on, somebody. This is, this is the truth. We need to continue in the faith. We need to remain grounded and steadfast. And we must not be moved away from the truth, from the hope of the gospel which we've heard, which, by which we were saved. Like we read in the other passage, you were saved by this gospel. Guys, this is so, so very clear. And it's just, it's, it pains my heart to see so many people, so many people believing in one saved, always saved. Because it's just such a detrimental, such a detrimental doctrine that just, does not teach the fear of God. He just complacently teaches lukewarmness. And it's just, gives people a license to sin, despite the fact that they will never say that it does. It does. I've heard countless testimonies of people saying that they, they felt that they had a license to sin because of this doctrine. So despite what people want to say, oh, it doesn't actually do that, the fruit says otherwise. So, and that's obviously not my main argument to say once they thought we saved is wrong or dangerous. It is just one of the byproducts of it. Um, the Bible is very clear, my friends. We need to continue in the faith. We need to remain grounded and steadfast in the faith, not being shaken, not being moved away from the truth. Amen, my friends. Thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next video, my friends. God bless you guys.